Hello, everyone. Welcome. You are listening to From Here with a View. Uh, we are the Seeds Philadelphia podcast. My name is Tylena Goyo, and I'm here with a very special guest today. I am here with Dr. Evan Adams. Evan Plesla Adams is a Coast Salish actor and physician from the Thla'amin First Nation near Powell River, BC, Canada. Evan stars at Thomas Builds the Fire and Miramax's Smoke Signals, written by Sherman Alexie and directed by Chris Eyre. He also won Best Actor Awards from the American Indian Film Festival, from First Americans in the Arts, and a 1999 Independent Spirit Award for Best Debut Performance. Aside from his career in the arts, Evan has completed a medical doctorate from the University of Calgary in 2002. He was the Deputy Provincial Health Officer for the province of BC from 2012 to 2014. In 2020, Evan took a leave from his position as the Chief Medical Officer of the First Nations Health Authority to join the federal government as the Deputy Chief Medical Officer of Public Health for Indigenous Services Canada. Welcome, Dr. Evan Adams. Tylen, so nice to see you. And oh my gosh, I almost fell asleep during the bio, but it did remind me. <laughs> it reminded me why we never get time to chat, you and I. Right? So we've known each other for a very, very long time. We won't go into the years, but there's a smoke signals tie-in, sort of, right? Yeah, well, I, I remember our first uh, show together was, uh, I remember we were in a Beads and Feathers thing. It was my first film, and but you were already, you were already working and like really well known in Canada at the time, but it was, we shot it in Wyoming and it was a pilot, right? And yes. so that's, that's actually where we met. It didn't surprise me. We met up again uh, when we were workshopping uh, smoke signals. Yeah, a lot, not many people know this story. Um, I had met Sherman Alexi when I was at Dartmouth, and he and a friend, John Cyrus, we, he was there to read, I think. And then we became friends, and he said that he was workshopping um, a short. And he asked me to be a part of it, and he, he asked me who he thought, if, if I had any ideas. And I said, I remember we worked together. Um, and I remember your character in the movie that we did for Fox. And I just, it, it made this connection. I was like, Evan is absolutely perfect. And so I shared that with Sherman. And and then we were able to work on um, the short, but it developed into something really beautiful where you worked on this incredible groundbreaking film and with a lot of other incredible Native actors. Can you share a bit about how it's really impacted your life? Isn't that amazing? Uh, gosh, I, I didn't find out until much later that you had brought me up to uh, to the people who eventually made Smoke Note Signal. So uh, thank you. I think I owe you, uh, I owe you a donut and a cup of coffee. <laughs> I'll take it. I love donuts. <laughs> Maybe I owe you a little more because I think Smoke Signals was like uh, winning the lottery. You know, you work on shows, you have no idea if something's going to hit or miss, if it's going to be great or if it's going to be like really a turkey. And uh, you just uh, do stuff like like when we work together on the short that eventually became the feature film that was Smoke Signals. You, know, you just do it with all your heart and you really want to bring your best to it. And And even when we were working on uh, that short film, I think it was called, this is what it means to say Phoenix, Arizona. Like what a, what a title. Yes. Uh, when we were working on it, yes. we had, uh, we had no idea that, you know, that it would become anything at all, let alone something that people m might remember. Even now, even now people ask me, aren't, aren't you that guy? <laughs> when, when you're walking down the street, people ask you, they recognize you, I'm sure all the time. Uh, we shot Smoke Signals in 1997. In 1998, I started medical school. So uh, the movie was playing while I was studying. And when I was seeing patients, once in a while, they would recognize me and say, oh, what the heck? I Did I just see you in a movie? And why are you here at my bedside? What is this? I imagine that must be a trip. <laughs> it's pretty funny. So, well, let's back up. This is This is something that's so interesting about you and your life is that you have always been interested in medicine even before you were acting so can you take us back then how did you get involved in acting even 
uh, like so many of us, so many indigenous people are told we need to go to university and, and uh, get some knowledge and skills and help the people. But it was really uh, kind of a burden when you're young, right? Like, you know, being a teenager, I, I was studying biochemistry at McGill and it was okay, but wow. pretty hard work, right? Uh, studying, studying science at a university level. And uh, one day I was walking down the street and I saw a sign. It said acting classes. And I was just standing there, just daydreaming. This woman came out. I eventually found out it was a casting agency that was offering acting classes. But came, one of the casting agents came out and she said, are you an actor? And I just totally just lied. Yes. <laughs> and she said, Can you come and audition for me tomorrow. So I skipped class and I, I went to read and I got my first job, which was um, a really kind of a big film uh, in Canada called Toby McTeague. And I was playing the second banana or, uh, you know, the first of my many Tonto roles, the sidekick roles. <laughs> and uh, I was making a lot of money just very suddenly. And it was so exciting. I was just, a, you know, I was just a teenager. So that's that's what got me started. And from there, did did your career just kind of take off? I don't know if it took off so much as I, I got a job. And once you've had one big job in, in film, it's easier to get another job. And uh, I was so lucky to have had such a great experience. I'd, I was I had many weeks on this film. And it was very clear to me when I finished that I had no skills, <laughs> that I should get some skills I should study. So actually, you know, I made a lot of money and I thought, okay, I'm going to go to theater school. I left university. I left biochemistry. And uh, I, I literally once uh, on that show bumped into the camera. <laughs> that's how, that's how <laughs> bad I was. <laughs> I bumped into the camera while I was trying to act. <laughs> and I, I, I thought I should study. So I went to theater school and I kept working and I kept working and I, I eventually, you know, got, got some skills and, and got a bit of notice for, for being a good worker. So I, I think that's really interesting that you fell into something and then it became such a passion for you. But did you, looking back to your before that time when you were much younger, in hindsight, are you seeing that that kind of passion for acting in theater and the arts develop in you? I was a bit of an egghead in school. Um, I, I could do the arts, like like um, I could draw and paint, and I like to sing traditional songs and do traditional dance, but I didn't really think of myself as as an actor. I remember meeting an Indigenous actor. Her name is Margot Kane. I was a teenager, maybe 15, and I remember thinking, that's amazing. I didn't even know they let Indians become actors. So that was my only uh, kind of hint. I just thought it sounded pretty amazing. It wasn't until I actually did it that I think I fell in love because I, I did get a chance to do lots of stuff that I I think I could have fallen in love with. But I kept coming back to acting because I just thought it was way cool. And I still think that. I still act a little bit now, even though I'm mostly a doctor now. Um, when I go on set, I, I remember my first love. So fast forward now to to after smoke or during smoke signals or after smoke signals when you went to medical school. And um, did you know what path you were going to take as a doctor? Uh, I did. You know, um, our, our business, sorry, uh, acting is kind of hard sometimes in that uh sometimes you're in shows that are a little bit simple and sometimes you're in shows that are not that interesting. And uh, eventually, I guess after 12 years of working professionally, it felt like a job. So I reached a point where I thought I need to go and finish um, medicine if, uh, or, or I'll, I'll be too old to train. Uh, even though everyone thought I was a teenager, I was already in my mid thirties. Uh, so, and I knew that and everyone said smoke was going to change your life. And I, I knew it wasn't going to, I knew that the industry hadn't changed that much. And I knew that if I never tried to be a doctor, that I would just regret it every day for the rest of my life, that I would look back and go, I could have been, I wanted to try, but I never did become a doctor so I tried and uh, I really took a risk because I thought 
what if I'm a terrible doctor? What if I fail out of school and I'll have given up all of this like acting stuff and maybe I'll fail at both of them, but I still took that risk. I, I would rather fail than just have one. So I thought if I'm lucky, I'll have one at the end of this. <laughs> and if I'm really lucky, I can do both at the end of this. And it, it worked out. I can't believe it. I almost killed me. It was a lot of work. <laughs> it was a lot of work, but, uh, but I'm here. So I'm so happy. It's remarkable what you've done. And it, a lot of times you, you don't hear these kind of stories. This is very unusual. Generally, if someone chooses the path of actor, then they're in that space or they're in more of the media entertainment or trying to be behind the scenes. And you've taken your path com in a completely different way, but then, but then came back around to acting. And I think, well, what I would like to know is how, how, how has the acting world changed well, isn't it amazing how the world has changed? It really has from when we were kids, but also um, we change. You know, at the beginning, I felt lucky to be on any film set, but it's not my first show anymore. It's not opening night anymore. <laughs> I've been doing this for a long time and it doesn't have the same cachet as it once did. And I did have this other goal. And I think we all have lots of goals. At least I hope we all have lots of goals. You want to be... You want to start a family you want to be a great parent you want to uh, fall in love and yeah eventually um being an actor uh wasn't the only thing i thought about anymore uh and i i tried this medical thing it was very time consuming it takes you know it took me 12 years of study and uh then you become a doctor and you work pretty hard uh, you know, like for instance, now now is the time of COVID, and I work eighty hour weeks, just like nearly impossible to maintain. But it's a worldwide pandemic, so so you just do it. But in the middle of that, just just like you, I uh, what you think you want and who you want to be changes. When you're a teenager, being a, a TV star or a movie star sounds pretty cool. When you're older, you realize um, being a good parent or being a good son or daughter or a good uh, husband or wife or whatever, all of those are pretty crucial too. So you have to spend some some time on it. And I it really occurred to me that I wanted to be a good person because uh, I did meet actors who are not very nice and I never wanted to be that. I always wanted to be someone who, who would try and help other people. And being a doctor, you are a helper, that's for sure. Uh, yes. And you are very much um, in the community, uh, working and listening to the needs of community. And we have that in common. I, I, uh, you and I, and I think a lot of our friends, we, we stay connected. Well, I know we like going to community events and seeing community arts and cheering people on. And we're invested in the people we know uh, and love and we want them to do to do well. I think that's pretty normal. Yes, absolutely. And and there's a lot to cheer on and celebrate now. Um, but even beyond that, the way you're working in community now with the, your job, um, and especially in this pandemic, you had mentioned to me that something was important. Um, and the community leader said to you, well, this is how we do it. And it was not exactly what the medical field was recommending, but you had to listen to what the needs of the community. Can you share that story? Oh, sure. Yeah, that happens all, all the time. I, at the beginning, I was taught how to um, deal with, you know, deal with situations. You know, the, the, your patient uh, has diabetes now and here's what you do. So I would often go into meetings when I was young, a young doctor and say, okay, I know just what to do. And didn't even really listen to what the patient wanted. And eventually you learn especially with our people, that there are certain things that they that they want. Uh, I remember one woman, uh, she had cancer. And I said, okay, well, let's talk about a plan. And she said, okay, I really need to call my sister. And I, you know, I thought, uh, can we talk about chemotherapy? And she said, no, I, I need to talk to my sister. And I, I, like many of us, had learned some humility, at least <laughs> as, a, as a young person. If that's what a person wants, it's actually really bad for you to go against them, like to interrupt their journey or to impose your will on them. 
uh, or it, like to not to not fulfill someone's wishes, and in this case, almost her last wishes, is really bad. So I just had to stop and say, okay, we'll call your sister. And that was a, and that happened like a thousand times after that, where you you say, okay, maybe I trained to act like a doctor, but in the end, uh, I have to do whatever needs doing in that in that moment. And uh, and that was a really, I don't know if other uh, doctors who are not indigenous learn that because we learn that as indigenous people too, to help and put our own self aside. I wasn't the I wasn't the star of the show. Uh, they are. Yes, that's a beautiful lesson. And so now, are you traveling a lot? You know, I used to travel. I used to travel a great deal. I used to t teach a lot and try and help um, workers uh, do better. But uh, you know, so many of us have to stay home now. But I, uh, I, I think I'm helping more than ever now. In that, uh, well, here in Canada, we've had um, over 500 communities who've had outbreaks, and so uh, you're you're going. I'm often going to places and saying, "Okay, what needs doing?" And it and it does vary from community to community. Sometimes they only have 10. People in a cluster, sometimes they have a hundred, sometimes they have a bunch of deaths, sometimes uh, not, sometimes their leadership is cool and calm, sometimes the leadership's like literally crying and begging for help. Um, each situation is different and you're, you're thinking on your feet, trying to do the best you can. And of course, I'm not the only one helping. There are lots of us who are helping with with COVID, so you're part of a quite a large um, response. So that's my day to day now, and I definitely can sleep at night knowing that uh, I'm doing my best to help people. And how do you manage taking care of yourself in all of this? <laughs> what a great question! It's been hard on all of us, right? This pandemic. I hear a lot of us are just straining. It's really tough. And I know uh, for the first twenty months, I really sacrificed my own health and my own time. I never saw my parents. I didn't see my kids. I I stopped uh, running. I stopped acting. Um, I stopped taking vacation. 80 hours a week, I was just working and barely sleeping for months. And uh, yeah, I could I could feel that I was sacrificing my, my mind and my body. Uh, eventually, I just had to like calm down and be very active about the things that I wouldn't do. Uh, so just as an example, I like to help um, at another level, like um, if if your mom had cancer and you had a really tough question, I could try and answer that. Uh, putting aside a lot of that, a lot of that other stuff was the only way I could, the only way I could survive. And I was amazed. You know, I really do get thousands of requests uh, for assistance um, outside of my work, uh, away from my, away from my work. It's there's a lot of need out there, but there's some, but I'm only one person. And and there is this inclination to do whatever you can. And it's kind of that irony, right? Because you're always focusing in your work on health and wellness in indigenous communities and making sure that 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 people are doing things to to keep themselves healthy, to keep their communities healthy, and in trying to share that information you were being affected because you were giving too much of yourself. And so those boundaries are really important. And I, I'm, I'm happy for you that you found the space to, to, you know, maintain health for yourself. It, you could see, it's just really painful for me to, to say, uh, to say no, but you really, it really is uh, mm -hmm. triage, right? Like who, who needs the most help and you, and you have to, you have to do it. And, and definitely, um, I get more people um, angry at me that I can't help them than people thanking me for helping them. That's just the nature of the business. I think that's a very human thing too, unfortunately. And, and especially if people don't know you personally, it's easy to lash out and make judgments. And that's unfortunate. I, I often talk about um, being a helper and asking for help. Because uh, I think when we're younger, we don't realize just how much help we need. And when you're older, you know better. Like during COVID, there were lots of people needing help. 
and uh, they would be surprised to to find themselves in a bad situation. And and I had to remind them, yeah, that's that's how it is. Like even something simple like having a baby or having a teenager, and you think I don't know what to do here, and you so you have to ask. For help, what do I what do I do? There's there's no shame in that. In fact, it's completely completely uh, normal. But it is humbling for some people. They they did I don't know why they didn't know that. I guess when you're young, right? You don't know what you don't know. Is how we put it in medicine. Oh yeah, when we're young, we have lots of judgments of how things should go and what people should do, right? I think that during this pandemic, it's made us really wake up to what what's important and thinking about how we do need each other. I'm hoping that that can stay. Um, I don't know that it will once, you know, the crisis, if and when hopefully it passes. Um, But it is an interesting lesson that I think a lot of people have learned and actually pointing back to indigenous ways. Yeah, I definitely have a feeling now that uh, I, I'm better at being balanced. I'm not so work focused. I, I feel a, a huge part of me saying, how are my friends doing? How, how are my sisters doing? I miss them. I, I'm absolutely going to be sitting with them or my kids. Like, uh, part of me would just love to be home, helping them with homework instead of mm-hmm. how I've been for the last, uh, you know, a couple of years. So I feel like, yeah, I've become much more human and maybe so many others too, because uh, this, this pandemic has shown us, yeah, we're, we're not alone. We're not, we're, we're, we're standing on the shoulders of others and we're part of an, part of a network. And so when you think about your work now um, and the future, are you hopeful or what's the outlook, <laughs> Dr. Evan Adams? Please tell us something good. <laughs> <laughs> well, definitely this wave, the fifth wave, the Omicron wave uh, is passing. Uh, definitely Omicron is showing us again and again that it is largely mild. It's not totally mild. Uh, for some of us, it's disastrous, uh, especially those who are unvaccinated. Uh, I think we're learning to deal with uh, the stress of change because the world we used to live in, it's it's gone now. The things we used to do, some of them are gone. And who knows if they'll ever uh come back i think uh i don't know i I, don't you feel like a different person than you were 22 months ago i do you know there's it's this consistent survival mode and especially with the children and making sure that they're mentally feeling well and able to do the things that make them feel whole and growing you know and socializing and and so that's always weighing on me all day long and then in terms of work it's just the world keep wants to keep going. And I keep, like you mentioned, I want to slow down and I keep saying that I'm going to, and then, it, and it, I, I can't get there somehow. And it's, there's so much less connection. So we're talking on zoom all the time and we're having meetings all day long, but I'm sitting in front of a computer screen and it just affects our whole, our health and our humanity really. I mean, I'm happy that we can have these conversations, right? And thank goodness for these, these kind of connections because otherwise there wouldn't, we wouldn't even have that, you know, and then always having to have gratitude and not getting caught up on any of the little things because, because a lot of people have had a a really hard time. And so, you know, whatever it is that we're going through is really mild in comparison to what is happening globally. Uh, that is so true. Um, maybe we are learning to be more grateful. Maybe we are um, truly learning grace and strength and uh, resilience. Because I think before it was, life was pretty easy. Most people spent their time uh, just wanting to feel good all the time and not having to think about too much. But I don't know how much that's the real world. And And what we're going through now is very real, right? It's it's very, very challenging. And I do remember many conversations with people who've had COVID and have suffered setbacks. And they've said to me, how, how am I going to get better? Like, uh, oh, I have COVID now. I have to self-isolate for five days. I can't go to, go to work. And I have to stay in my bedroom at home. And this really sucks. And I have to remind them, but you're alive. 
you're not in ICU, you're not in a hospital, you're at home and staying in your room for 10 days isn't the same as staying in your room for a year and um, and you have, a, you have a chance to get better. Lots of people didn't get that chance. And I just have to remind them, it, it sounds like it could be worse. I'm, I'm trying to say to them it could be worse, but really I'm trying to say to them, there's still a lot to be thankful for. Uh, and I remind myself of that all the time, that self-talk at the end of the day. I feel sorry for myself and I think, well, my great grandfather lived through a smallpox epidemic that blinded and scarred him. Uh, some of my friends, uh, you know, lost a lot of their health when they got COVID and I'm you know, still here. I'm okay. Lots of people have way more challenges than, than I do. I think I agree with everything you're saying, but I also think that we need to be conscious of allowing ourselves those feelings and, you know, you get you get a day of that, or you know, you get a day to feel sorry or whatever, and then you and then you pick yourself up and say, okay, what can I do to make things better? And I do remind myself and others, uh, it and it actually is helpful to say, I don't feel good today about where I find myself. I miss my friends, or I'm I'm mad about uh, the outbreak, or I'm mad at someone about vaccination. So just say it. it does mean that you need to do something bad with those feelings just to acknowledge them so you can work through them. And that's why I say it. I'm tired. I, I say it because I'm, I'm reminding myself, yeah, you've been working pretty hard. <laughs> I'm tired. That's why maybe I'm a bit crabby today or maybe that's why I feel a little bit um, off. Are you proud of yourself? No, I don't feel proud of myself at all. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> that wasn't the answer I it would, was expecting or wanted. <laughs> <laughs> help me out oh you know it's it's like um and you've probably had this like when you see yourself on on tv it's like oh no oh <laughs> that's what it feels like it it's like oh i would uh, one day i'll be able to look back and say yeah i was there during covid and i was i was helping out uh and i'll barely be able to kind of stand tolerate that thought but right now all i can think is yeah, I'm here. I wish there was someone, uh, you know, better than me. I, th there isn't anyone uh, to take my place. I know that. Uh, like all my work is valuable, but uh, I, I feel like shy about about that. Nobody needs to thank me. I am working hard. That's what I trained for, and it is a privilege, right? It, I, I'm working from a very privileged uh, place, and to walk with people. And our, I hear our elders say that, like when you walk with someone when they're having a hard time, it is a privilege to walk with them. Even if it's very painful for you, it's like this vicarious trauma. Um, it, there is something very holy to the work of helping. And I think many indigenous people are, are in the service of others. And it's, a, it's quite a thing that we don't talk about uh, enough. In fact, most people uh, uh, wanna talk about being an actor and they don't want to talk about what's it like to be a helper and to help people. And I think I'm way more proud of, of uh, who I've helped than, you know, putting on putting on makeup and hair, putting hairspray on and, you know, dancing in front of the, the camera. <laughs> Not that it's that bad. I was thinking today about how you are an actor and you're a doctor and how much listening is important to both of those career paths. And I would love to for you to share a bit about why you think that is. Uh, listening. Yeah. Gosh, you know, I, I went into acting because I thought it would help people like to, to hear stories. Like, uh, like for instance, I, I played a boy who was being sex, sexually abused when I was a teenager. And I thought, oh, that's a, that's a play that, that theater piece would help people understand, uh, like, survivors of sexual exploitation or sexual abuse without having gone through that their own sexual abuse like wanting to help people sometimes isn't enough sometimes if you have good experience or good skills like uh, like cancer right i i know how to help in lots of different ways when someone's on a cancer journey because i have knowledge and, and experience and and part of that is really seeing the person in front of you i i know you called it listening i i would say it's really seeing them it's not someone with cancer. This is, uh, you know, a 14-year-old girl. 
She has two sisters. She's indigenous. She's, she's, you know, let's say she's Mi'kmaq, you know, some very specific culture. And so you're like watching and hearing and trying to capture as much as you can hold. It's, um, that's not something that's uh, very natural to do, to really just see. In fact, lots of us don't see them at all. We, we don't see the people next to us very well uh, at, at all. So it really is uh, a gift to be a, a part of a part of that. Uh, and, and it is very hard to. Do you think it's an exercise in empathy or is that not the right word? Is it, you're saying like really seeing them. So it's not trying to feel what they're going through, but it's mm. actually seeing who they are as like a spirit, like as human, but even beyond that. It's really seeing them in their journey because they're telling you, this is what's important to me. This is what's going on. So for instance, uh, in seeing patients with cancer, using that old example again, uh, people do have different uh, reactions. I, I was trained to steer them towards uh, treatment. That's what, I, that's what I'm there for. But to really see them and hear them in, in those moments, uh, they really are different. Uh, people can have, you can tell them you have cancer and, uh, you know, stage four, and some will be so terrified, like they've not thought about their own mortality at all. Um, some, their immediate thought is, what about my kids? What am I going to do about my kids? And then, and then others are like, okay, I've had the most amazing life. I feel so much peace. It's thank you. And of course, those are extremes and everything in between. Um, but in there, they're telling you uh, what they want, what they need. Uh, and you have to really watch and hear. And and because you remember, you're only one person and they're dealing with lots and lots and lots and lots of people between now and the end of their journey. You're, you're just, you're just going to do your part, but you're listening because uh, as someone who's uh, uh, very highly trained. We're going to pick up certain pieces. Uh, if she needs me to call her sister, I'll do that. But probably there are other things about her journey that I understand uh, quite well, better than almost everyone that sh that she can ask me to help her with. And so I will I will do that. So that's about seeing and hearing them. It's a, it's very focused um, work and. It's not something you can do care carelessly, or it's something you don't want to do uh, carelessly when people are asking for help. And I and I have been less than perfect, for sure. I definitely have been with uh, a few people, and I look back and I think, oh, I wasn't, I didn't quite know how to deal with that. I wasn't quite successful with that. Um, and that's part of the journey for me as well. It's like, okay, get up. You didn't. You weren't amazing but there's another person waiting for you, uh, like literally 10 feet away and they're waiting for you to help them. You've got to pull yourself together and, and go. And that's, that's, you know, my, my work. It's very, I find it infinitely um, interesting. I just think it's beautiful to listen to your, um, so about your self, self-awareness and growth. And even, even with acting and, and your whole path um, over these years is just so incredible. And I, I hope that you, I know you don't have a lot of time for it. And we're so honored that you spent this time here with us today. But I hope that you are able to, when you do get a break from COVID, continue telling these stories about your life, because I think you're an extraordinary example of what it is to be a good person, you know, and a good friend and a good citizen and good community member. And, and we need more of that. Your, your being so public facing is, is helping so many. Well, thank you for bringing me on. Cause honestly, I don't get asked a lot. Uh, uh, what's it like to, you know, do what you do. What's it like to help people as a physician or to help our people specifically, I hardly get asked that question uh, at all, even by people who are in the same business uh, as me in Indigenous health. And I think there are um, a lot of learnings in it. There are, there are lots of stories uh, in, in there about 
who we are. And it, they're actually very beautiful stories because a lot of our people are very kind and funny and strong and they have unbelievable stories uh, that inform, you know, what they're going through today with me. So, so thanks for bringing that up. I do, um, I do love working with our people. Well, really, I don't know if I could even call it work. Being with our people, uh, and and doing um, and doing what I what I do, and I hope that uh, more and more of our stories about who we are, because uh, we are very natural storytellers. I know my father would teach us lessons about life by telling stories about how others have lived their lives. Uh, and uh, we don't even really, we didn't really have a name for it. Those teachings of our ways, ta'au, our ways. Uh, and uh, it is our way to share stories. This is what I what I did today. So thank you for asking me about about my work. It, it very rarely happens. Well, you're welcome. So honored. I want to talk about the juggling all of the things. Uh, we touched upon it a little bit. Just uh, your transition from being in the sciences, moving to acting, going back to medical school. We had had a conversation recently where you said something like that you can do, we can do all the things. We just can't do them all at the same time. And I'm wondering, had you found that to be a struggle? And do you think that having such different lives and different worlds um, is complicated. Do, do you, I, mm. would you have done anything different? I think, I think uh, we are all trying to keep our balance. Uh, we have many things that we need to maintain. So uh, I, I could have just been a workaholic actor, but I decided, no, there are other parts of my life that I think are really important. And it doesn't matter what other people say. What's important is what I think and feel. So uh, like many people, I, I have a home life and I um, try and do my best with my physical health, like exercise and eat proper food. And uh, I'm, I try and be respectful and to listen to my uh, elders and our ways. So, you know, all of those take, take time and energy, but it's never really quite in balance. Like right now I'm thinking, oh, I, I haven't done my run today yet. And I didn't do my run yesterday. And it's not that I'm a bad person or that I'm overachieving or anything. It's just, that's another thing that I'm, that needs to be, to be done. But when I'm running, I'm not looking after my kids or I'm not visiting with my parents. I'm not learning my language. And so, yeah, you can't do everything at once, but you can still try and keep all the balls in the air uh, that you're that you're comfortable with. Um, just do what you think uh, is good and important. And of course, you must do what needs doing. And I think the third part is you must do the things that you promised you would do. What do you mean by honor your promises? Yeah, uh, the, the Hawaiians have a word, I think it's kuliana, uh, responsibility. And uh, for me, uh, in my planning for the health of the people, I, I, there are things that I should do, like plan for diabetes, because there's a lot of diabetes in communities, so I have to do that. And then I have to respond to emergencies, like COVID. I can't just say, oh, I'm busy with diabetes now. I can't deal with COVID. It's like, oh, okay, this is an emergency. So uh, things I should do, emergencies. And then there are the things that I promised I would do. You know, I said I do to my husband. I promised my kids I would be there for them. I can't just ditch them. I can't just ditch my, my honorable parents, uh, their responsibility. And responsibility is not a bad thing at all. We just acknowledge. I promised I would do that. So I'm going, I'm going to do that. And you can see it's a problem even when you say things like, oh, I'll clean out the garage tomorrow. And then you don't do it and people get mad at you and then you get mad at yourself and it just turns into something terrible. It's just <laughs> easier to do your, do what you promise. I was thinking about obligation today and specifically familial obligation and how you, it, there's something special about it. And I, I've lived away from my parents for so long and now I'm here. 
and they're getting older and I get to see them every weekend now. And it's kind of a set thing that we know that we're seeing each other. And, and sometimes I, I feel this is going to be a lot for me today because I have to clean my house or I have the, and I'm like, and then I, and then I go, Oh, wait a minute. Hello. Wake up. Let's think about how lucky you are that you still have them and that we get to spend time together and how many more great jokes or stories or laughs or beautiful moments that I'll have. And, um, and you, I agree with you. I think responsibilities and obligation can be good things. I don't. I don't ever want to um, reach the end of my parents' life and say, "Oh, I forgot to visit them." Uh, yeah, that that you made time for them. That's that's a really a really good thing. But in the moment, it's like, "Oh, I have to drop everything and and go and see them." So um, you mentioned that you are married. You have a husband and. Um, as long as I've known you, you've been um, out, and I was I was interested to hear more about your experience as an actor, um, because I know that you had talked about um, either roles being limiting or people not wanting to really see who you are or cast you as who you are. Hmm. When I was coming out in the eighties as a as a gay man and i was uh just starting my career as an actor uh and and i have to say i was uh, very privileged growing up i grew up with a very strong uh father and mother and i was very self-assured uh confident and and uh so when i came out to my parents and i had friends who said yeah you should come out to your parents you love your parents you should they should know who you are and i i told my dad and uh, I said to him, you know, people are going to talk about me. They're going to hear that I'm gay. And he said, oh, don't worry about us. Like, no one's going to say anything bad about you to me. <laughs> and my dad's, uh, I knew my dad. I knew that he would never let someone put me down. And that, and that, again, emboldened me and made me think, yeah, that's how parents should be. They should, they should love their kids. And, uh, you know, I have kids now and uh, some of them identify straight and I still love them. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, always, <laughs> I always think it's odd when people say that. Isn't it funny? I'm glad you make that joke. I hope it makes people think. It, it does. I, I remember a number of times it makes people, people have come up to me and said, you know, I have a gay son or daughter or whatever. And they'll say, and I'm struggling. And I'll tell them that story and I'll say, you know, I have a son who really likes sports. He's straight. I still love him. <laughs> <laughs> he watches sports all day long. I still love him. <laughs> no matter what. <laughs> so I hope things are changing now because when I was when I was a theater student, I thought I could play everybody. I, I seriously wanted to play Juliet. I, in Romeo and Juliet, I thought, wouldn't that be cool to let, you know, a young man again? Because, of course, before in the Shakespearean tradition, those parts were played by men, young men. I said, let, let me play Juliet. I'll, I'll knock this out of the ballpark. And people thought I was really uh, like even kind of icky and weird. And there were lots of things like uh, when Smoke Signals came came along and they said, we want you to play Thomas. Uh, I thought, Thomas, you want me to play Resi? But I, you know, I, I have, you know, a university degree and uh, I've lived in the city a long time and I think I'm pretty cool and hip. <laughs> you should, you should uh, let me play Victor, <laughs> which is, you know, of course, completely silly now, but, but I really uh, just wanted to, uh, I just wanted to act. And, um, and I did find out that, you know, you know, I'm not tall I'm quite short. And uh, as a gay man, uh, people would see me in a certain way. Uh, and I, I uh, had to kind of not think of myself as a, as a leading man. And recently I did do a leading man role. And I thought, wow, this young female indigenous director said, uh, who cares what the idea of a leading man is? Let's, you know, give it to the short gay guy and see what he can do. And I thought, oh, that's... That's amazing because, of course, our way, we have so many stories about so many kinds of people, not just tall, beautiful, 
people. And, uh, and in fact, if you watch TV, you still see so many of the roles are still tall, beautiful, um, white people. And there's much more uh, in the world uh, than that. So I, I, hope, I hope the world is changing because I do love seeing uh, interesting, different characters, um, actors like I've never seen or heard from before who are so completely different from me. What a, what a gift. Absolutely. I agree with you. And there is such incredible talent. And if you think about how narrow years ago, it was even more narrow and thinking about all the people who were left and had to move on to do other things and not stay in acting because of that, because they weren't given an opportunity and the brilliance that we missed out on. And so luckily we're seeing some of that now and, and it, we they still have a long way. To, Hollywood's got a long way to go, but <laughs> but but it's nice that there are some really great gems here and there, and so so we're moving forward. Well, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I know it is absolutely very precious, and you have a lot of uh, world saving to do. So I just want to thank you so so very much for coming on to our podcast. Um, I'm really honored to have you as a guest and, and as a friend, Evan, and um, thank you so much. Uh, I'm sending you a big hug. Thank you for being so open and so kind and generous, uh, letting me be on your show. And thank you for all your work with uh, community. I know you love our people and are doing wonderful things for them. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Tyler Nogoyo, and you've been listening to From Here with a View, a We Are the Seeds Philadelphia podcast. From Here with a View, a We Are the Seeds Philadelphia podcast is produced by Michelle St. John with music by Zachariah Julian and original logo art by Jason Wiesaw. This podcast is funded in part by Independence Public Media Foundation.